Well, welcome everybody to the Chappaqua Library virtual series. My name is Joan Kuhn and I'm the program coordinator at the library. Today we have a wonderful program planned and um, I wasn't the only one who helped plan this. This is a collaboration by many libraries in Westchester County. And while I'm mentioning all these wonderful libraries in Westchester County, I want to urge all of you to go to your library's website and look at all the offerings that the libraries offer. We all have multiple programs that you could enjoy online. And you could go to any one of the 38 Library Westchester um, programs. Your library card is good in all 38 libraries. So with that, I want to thank the following libraries. Somers Library, White Plains Library, a Pound Ridge Library, North Salem Library, New Rochelle Library, Lewisboro, Lewisboro Library, Tuckahoe Library, Ossining Library, uh, Yonkers Library, Mount Pleasant Library, and of course, Chappaqua Library. So thank you all. And now I would like to introduce today's speaker. His name, as you heard, is um, Ben Goldfarb. Ben Goldfarb grew up here in Westchester County, so we're really proud. He's like a local boy who now lives in Colorado. And um, he is an environmental journalist, and he's written for the National Geographic and Atlantic and many, many other uh, magazines. He is also an author of another book. This book is called Eager About Beavers. And if you were here earlier, I was fascinated by that topic, that title. I thought it was really a good, good one. So thank you. Anyway, he is an environmental journalist and his book, which you, is called Crossings, How Road Ecology is Shaping the Future of Our Planet. And it is available in any local bookstore. Please go to your individual indie bookstores or Barnes and Nobles, Amazon, and all the other platforms you could get. And on your chat function, Ben was good enough to uh, put down an email address that you could, uh, not an email, a link that you could use to get the book. With that, I welcome uh, Ben and thank you for coming. Fantastic. Well, th thank you so much, Joan, for that introduction. And thanks to all of the uh, the other library sponsors. And thanks to all of you for, for being here. As, as Joan mentioned, uh, I'm from Westchester. I grew up in Hastings on Hudson uh, and, uh, you know, certainly have had to avoid uh, plenty of deer on the sawmill over the years. And so this is a, uh, a topic that uh, has been near and dear to my heart for a, a, a very long time. Uh, and uh, I'm sure I'm sure a lot of you have had that experience as well. And we'll, we'll talk about deer uh, plenty tonight, as you might as you might imagine. Uh, so <clears throat> this this book <laughs> and this talk this evening are about road ecology, which is this field of science that looks at all of the different ways that roads interact with and shape and, and transform nature. And, you know, roads are so transformative uh, in large part because there are just so many of them, right? Uh, there are something like 4 million miles of road uh, here in the U.S. alone, uh, around 40 million miles of road uh, around the world, and, and maybe 15 million miles more or so that are kind of in progress right now that, that will be built in the next couple of decades. So we're in the middle of this kind of wave of new construction that some scientists have called the infrastructure tsunami, uh, which really stands to uh, kind of reshape uh, the, the planet in a major way. And, you know, I think in part because roads are so abundant and ubiquitous, we don't think about them very much, right? We use them every day. They're a little bit in invisible to us. And, you know, when we, when we do think about them, we think about them in, in, I think, fundamentally positive terms, right? Uh, you know, they're they're how we get to schools and hospitals and grocery stores. You know, they're, they're really useful in all kinds of ways. And they're also these powerful symbols of human mobility and momentum and freedom, right? You know, Springsteen and Kerouac, the whole romance of the open road. Uh, you know, they're how we get around. And, you know, I think that that kind of road mythology is somewhat ironic because, you know, roads do precisely the opposite to other forms of life, right? To wild animals, they curtail uh, animal movement and mobility and, and freedom uh, in in uh, truly an immense scale. Uh, you know, there are more than a million animals killed by cars every day in the U.S., uh, which is which is uh, you know I just think a kind of an astonishing thing to contemplate. That's and that's just vertebrate animals, right? That's you know backboned animals. To say nothing of all of the uh, you know insects and arachnids uh, that are killed as well. And you know I think in part uh, because, you know, the animals that we tend to see are the relatively abundant ones, like the white-tailed deer and the raccoons and the opossums, you know, we don't really think about roads 
as being a, a true conservation crisis. But you know, certainly there are dozens of threatened and endangered species for which the primary source of mortality is, is vehicle collisions, right? We're literally you know, driving these animals uh, like ocelots and Florida panthers and tiger salamanders uh, to extinction. And in fact, as you know, some rhodicologists have observed, uh, you know, driving is literally the, the leading direct human cause of vertebrate mortality on land, right? There's nothing that we do that kills more wild animals directly uh, than drive, which I think is, you know, again, kind of a, an astonishing thing to, to contemplate. And, you know, certainly it's not a um, it's not a, an American problem, you know, although we do have the, lar the planet's largest road network. Uh, it's truly a global problem, right? One of the places I, I went to I went uh, in the course of this uh, this book writing experience was Brazil. And, you know, in Brazil, there were giant anteaters and, and cars are the leading source of mortality for giant anteaters, right? So anywhere you go in the world, uh, you know, roads and traffic and cars are, are truly this enormous uh, threat to, to biodiversity. And certainly that's, you know, that's, that's true in New York state where, you know, bobcats and fishers and black bears and other, uh, you know, relatively rarer species, at least compared to deer and raccoons uh, are, are being uh, killed in, in large numbers as well. You know, I think that, that one of the, the things that makes roadkill so pernicious and, and tragic in a way uh, is, the, is the way that it, it hijacks and, and subverts evolution, right? You think about the defense mechanisms of, you know, so many common beloved species, turtles that withdraw into their shells or porcupines that bristle their quills or skunks that spray, you know, these are all kind of stand your ground strategies that worked really well for thousands of generations against mountain lions and hawks and and coyotes and other natural predators but you know of course when your predator is uh you know an f-150 barreling down i-87 at, at 80 miles an hour you know the worst possible thing you can do is withdraw into your shell right you, you don't want to hunker down and so you know I, I think there's something again really tragic about that about the way that roadkill and, and traffic takes evolutionary history and renders it not only moot, but actually maladaptive. But so, so roadkill is, you know, sort of the, the most conspicuous, obvious way that roads interact with nature, right? Again, we've all seen the dead deer by the side of the highway, but, you know, but roadkill is really just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to all of the different interactions and connections that, uh, that road ecology, this field of science that I'm writing about addresses. Uh, you know, roads are these vectors of invasive species, right? There are, you know, non-native plants and animals all over the world that have basically, you know, entered ecosystems uh, along a grid, right? Uh, you know, dandelions along along roadsides, for example. Uh, this is a uh, an old logging road in uh, Montana, where which I visited in the course of writing this book, and you know, there for decades. All of these non-native thistle, thistle seeds were transported, uh, trapped in the treads of logging truck tires. And then, you know, all of those thistles kind of bloomed at once. Uh, and you get this, you know, eerie purple linear stripe across the landscape. And, you know, you can sort of see the perfect signature of this road in the form of non-native vegetation. It's, it's pretty striking. Roads are these, these zones of erosion, right? They're all of these geological and hydrological impacts of roads, uh, you know, you, I mean, especially dirt roads, uh, you know, which we have certainly hundreds of thousands, if not millions of miles of dirt roads, uh, you know, in this country, and certainly plenty in the Catskills and the Adirondacks and the other kind of rural corners of New York, you know, and you get a big uh, rain event or snow melt runoff and uh, you know those those dirt roads basically turn liquid you know and all of that sediment runs off into streams and ponds and wetlands and you know smothers uh, fish eggs and amphibian larvae and, and so on right so just because a road isn't very highly trafficked doesn't mean it's not having uh, you know really significant impacts on on nature. Roads are sources of pollution right our cars are constantly bleeding, you know, cadmium and and uh, zinc and copper and microplastics and all, all kinds of stuff into the environment. Uh, you know, when we're learning more and more about these chemical impacts all the time, uh, you know, the, a couple of years ago, there was this big study uh, in Washington state, which basically found that, you know, many, many years of salmon die off uh, was being caused by uh, six PPD, which is a, a chemical added to tires um, as an ozone protector and all of these little tire particles, you know, we're bleeding into streams and, and killing fish. And, you know, again, that's the only place where that's really been studied, but, you know, certainly that's happening to, you know, brook trout and other species in, uh, in, in upstate New York as, as well, right? So we're learning more all the time about, you know, kind of the immense uh, chemical impacts of roads on nature. 
One of those impacts is, is road salt. You know, we add 20 million tons of road salt as a de-icing agent uh, to our, our highways every year. And that, you know, that road salt just runs off into rivers and streams and wetlands and lakes uh, and turns freshwater brackish. You know, something like half of the lakes uh, in the Northeast and, and the, the Midwest uh, are experiencing long-term salinization, right? They're turning saltier uh, over time because of uh, because of, of road salt. And you know that road salt is also a really dangerous uh, situation. You know we know that animals are attracted to salt. Uh, that's why you know you see you see sort of animal trails leading to salt licks, natural salt licks in nature. Well, guess what? We've turned our entire highway system into this you know four million mile long salt lick, uh, which lures deer and moose and all kinds of other critters to the roadside, and again you know creates this this really dangerous uh, predicament. Uh, I will say that the road salt issue has uh, inspired my favorite road sign, uh, which is in Jasper National Park in Canada every winter. You can see uh, a sign that says, do not let moose lick your car. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure you can stop a moose from licking your car. I think if a, if a moose wants to lick your car, he's probably going to do it. But I, I do like the, uh, the sentiment behind that, that sign. Roads are also kind of these hellscapes of noise, right? Uh, you know, you get all of this engine and tire noise, especially, you know, tires at, at highway speeds, tires are actually louder than uh, than, than the engines. Uh, and, you know, that's a huge disruptor to wildlife, right? If you're a meadow lark or any songbird who has to sing to attract a mate and your mate can't hear you, uh, you know, over the, the noise of engines and tires, uh, you know, you functionally can't live in that place, right? So a road might only be 100 feet wide from shoulder to shoulder, and yet this kind of acoustic envelope, uh, you know, can span a, a mile or more in some cases. And I'll add that, you know, that road noise is a huge uh, public health issue for humans as well, right? Road noise is elevating our cortisol levels and blood pressures and heart rates and making us more susceptible to cardiac disease and stroke and all kinds of other, other issues. So, you know, road noise, I think it's, I, you know, I've really come to think that it's one of the biggest ecological and, and, and public health kind of unsung crises, uh, you know, of our, our time. But it's not all doom and gloom, right? And a lot of what I write about in the in the book is, you know, the notion of roads as ecosystems, uh, in a in a sense. You know, yes, roads destroy habitat, but they also create habitat. Animals are kind of endlessly opportunistic and creative and and flexible, uh, and they found a way of taking advantage of all of this, uh, all of these niches that we've created. Uh, I was in Minnesota a couple of years ago, and I, I visited this highway overpass, and you know, on the underside of the overpass were all of these these crevices, and there were hundreds of uh, little brown bats roosting in these crevices, uh, which was pretty pretty cool to see. You know, this animal that, is, that was taking advantage of this this habitat we created for it. Another good example of of uh, you know road habitat are, are roadsides, right? And you know, in many places, those roadsides are kind of the largest form of you know uncultivated public land, right? With so much of this country is you know corn or soy or lawn monoculture, and you know those roadsides are some of the last kind of wild strips of prairie out there in, in some cases, and they've become, you know, good habitat or at least, you know, viable habitat uh, for all kinds of, uh, all kinds of insects, uh, including monarch butterflies. You know, the, the kind of the main monarch migration through the Midwest goes from Minnesota to Texas, uh, you know, basically in parallel with I-35 now, which is, you know, kind of, kind of uh, it, it incredible. But, you know, it's also a dangerous habitat, right? And millions of, uh, of monarch butterflies are killed by cars uh, every, every year, and certainly that's you know happening in, in New York as well. So you know the road is a, a resource, but it's also uh, potentially an ecological trap, right? This place that lures animals in with the promise of milkweed and, and other flowers, uh, and then uh, then then kills them. You know that's that's also happening with with scavengers as well, right? You know all kinds of animals like coyotes and raccoons and skunks and bald eagles and and ravens and magpies. You know are all coming to the roadside to eat that roadkill that we've you know, we've, we've given them. Um, and, you know, again, there's, you know, potentially uh, a lot of value there. Um, but uh, obviously, you know, a bald eagle who has a belly full of venison, you know, it takes him a minute to achieve liftoff and he's at risk of being hit by a car himself, right? So as, as always, you know, the road's a habitat, but it's also uh, potentially a, a trap. And of course, it's not just animals that are, are getting hit uh, by, by cars and endangered by, by vehicles, right? It's, it's us humans as, as well. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure that uh, most of the people uh, on this, this webinar have had some kind of, you know, near miss or, or incident, uh, you know, featuring a, a deer or other, other uh, 
other animal, you know, and, and deer are, uh, you know, I think unbeknownst to most people, the most dangerous wild animal in the country. Uh, you know, more people are killed and injured by by deer collisions than by any other form of wildlife interaction. And of course, you know, it's not uh, the deer's fault, right? It's the car's fault. And yet, you know, it's kind of an amazing testament, I think, to how abundant uh, these animals are and how frequently we run into them. Uh, you know, there are between uh, one and two million deer vehicle collisions or DVCs uh, in the United States every every year. The average deer collision costs more than $9,000 now to society and, you know, hospital bills and vehicle repairs and insurance costs and uh, the, re the rest of it. Um, you know, there are up to 400 drivers killed by, by uh, deer collisions every year. And that's a, you know, a really, serious underestimate, um, you know, most most researchers think those are just the documented ones, lots of single car crashes, you know, a car veers off the road in the middle of the night and hits a telephone pole. Uh, well, you know, there's no way of knowing why that happened. But you know, in many cases, uh, that's likely veering to avoid an animal, right. So certainly, you know, many, many hundreds, uh, if not thousands of people are, are dying in these these uh, these deer related crashes uh, every year. Uh, and you know, New York is one of the epicenters of that. Uh, you know, certainly the Hudson Valley is, uh, you know, one of the places where that's uh, occurring uh, in, in huge numbers. You know, there are something like 60,000 deer vehicle collisions in New York every year, uh, which is about one every eight minutes. So, you know, in the course of this uh, conversation tonight, there will be something like a half dozen uh, deer collisions somewhere in the, the state of New York. Although, really, those collisions are happening primarily in the fall you know, October, November, early December, uh, that's when the deer are in the rut, they're, that's kind of their breeding season, they kind of move around more and seem to be thinking a little less. Uh, and it's also when, uh, you know, it's getting, it's getting darker earlier. So rush hour kind of corresponds with twilight, uh, which is, of course, the most dangerous time. It's deer clock. So anyway, uh, just to say that, uh, you know, right now isn't deer, deer collision prime time, but, uh, you know, come October, watch, watch out. So the way that uh, you know transportation departments around the country and really around the world have tended to handle this situation, this this epidemic of of uh, you know deer and other animal collisions, is by putting up signs. Right? We've all seen ten million of these these uh, you know yellow diamonds with the leaping black buck. And I'll just tell you uh, you know empirically what what you've probably intuited, which is that you know these things don't really work. Right? They're all over the place. They're kind of you know white noise at this point. We all sort of ignore them. Uh, you know they're 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 put up in kind of a, a scattershot, uh, non-systematic way. Um, often you see this kind of thing, you know, do you watch out for deer for the next 30 miles. And obviously no driver is going to, you know, keep her foot on the, the brake for 30 miles and remain alert, right? Um, and yet, you know, despite their ineffectiveness, you know, signs have really become kind of the default solution uh, all over the place. Um, you know, you, you see these, you see these in, in every country for every organism imaginable. Uh, and, you know, they're, they're really sort of this cheap public expression of concern, right, for, uh, you know, for <clears throat> um, transportation departments, you know, to just say, hey, look, we're aware of the problem, we're doing something about it, you know, we put up some signs, and, uh, you know, we're, we're good. Um, but in fact, you know, wildlife biologists uh, I've, I've talked to call these things litter on sticks, right? They're sort of fundamentally uh, useless and, and don't uh, don't accomplish uh, a whole a whole lot. Uh, and you know, I'll, I'll point out too that look, you know, co collisions, even if signs were effective in preventing cars from hitting animals, you know, they don't they'd only be solving half of the problem that roads create, right? And in some ways, the bigger problem than the collision, at least from you know, the wild animals perspective, uh, is the barrier effect. You know, the fact that so many of our highways, uh, especially our busy highways, like you know, the New York Thruway, I-87, I I uh, you know, and the Sawmill and the Taconic, uh, you know, they have these kind of constant streams of traffic that are basically impossible for animals to negotiate, right? Uh, you know, how are you going to cross I-87 on, on foot if you're, uh, if you're a wild animal? It's, you know, it's, it's functionally in, impossible. And that loss of habitat connectivity, that barrier effect that the highway creates is, you know, in some senses, even worse than roadkill itself. And, you know, here's one illustration of that, that idea. 
Um, so one of the places I went in working on this this book was was uh, southwestern Wyoming, uh, and and there there's this big herd of mule deer, which is kind of a very closely related sister species to white-tailed deer. Uh, and you know there's this big herd of migratory deer. They you know they they walk up into the mountains in the summer to eat the you know the fresh cool grasses, and then they come back in the winter uh, to try to find you know a snow-free place uh, to uh, to do their thing. Uh, and the problem is that you know their winter range where they want to be you know in the cold snowy season they're basically prevented from getting there by i-80 right which is you know the giant uh, interstate that runs across the country uh east to west uh and so this image is basically a, a picture of of uh of mule deer satellite collar points right so the, so the scientists they put these satellite collars on these animals and they get all of these gps points basically telling them you know where the animals move and where they like to hang out uh, and what you can see very clearly in this this image uh, is that you know these deer basically never cross I-80, right? There's again this constant wall of of traffic uh, that these animals can't negotiate, uh, and as a result, uh, they can't get to that really good winter range, that winter habitat uh, to the south of the interstate. And in some years, 40% of that deer herd will just starve because they can't reach uh, all of that all of that good food uh, south of the highway. Um, and so again, that's you know that's almost worse than roadkill, right? You know, a, a big herd of deer, you know, they can handle uh, a few collisions on the highway. That's not going to destroy them. You know, what's going to destroy them is losing access to all of that good habitat because of that you know that wall of traffic. Here's another, uh, you know, another another point, uh, you know, or another image rather, illustrating, you know, kind of much the same point. These are the satellite color points uh, of a young male grizzly bear uh, in uh, in Montana um, trying to cross I-90. That's the white line across the screen, and every single red X on, in this image is a place where that bear, you know, approached the highway uh, and then kind of bounced off like a ping pong ball, just repelled by that uh, that that wall of traffic, right? So this bear tried to cross the highway more than 40 times over the cross of uh, over the course of six months uh, before he finally found a, a way across on the the far left side of the screen. And again, you know, this is I mean, these are you know kind of Western examples, right? But this is happening in the Hudson Highlands. This is happening, you know, up near Storm King. There are scientists up there, you know, who have put satellite collars on bobcats and black bears and fishers uh, and seen, you know exactly the same dynamic where these animals are trying to cross I-87 uh, and they're unable to. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there are big patches of otherwise good habitat that, you know, don't have these critters like bobcats and fishers uh, in them um, because of this, this barrier effect, right? So again, you know, a road might only be 100 feet wide from shoulder to shoulder, and yet it's, you know, it's denying animals access to, you know, in some cases, many, many thousands of acres of, of, uh, of good habitat. Here's another uh, another illustration of you know kind of a similar idea. These are these are mountain lion satellite collar points in Southern California. This is just west of Los Angeles, uh, and here you know the red lines are uh, those are the, the big big uh, freeways. You know that's that's the 101 and the 405. You know some of the busiest uh, roads on on Earth. You know hundreds of thousands of cars uh, every single day. And you know what you can see very clearly is that you know these different colors, which represent the different mountain lions never cross the roads, right? The roads have basically isolated them. So that, you know, there's this little cluster, uh, this little population of mountain lions in the Santa Monica Mountains, and they can't leave the mountains and no new mountain lions can enter the population, right? Because they've, they've, they've just been stranded in this ocean of roads. Uh, and so, you know, the consequence of that is that, you know, these cats are stuck mating with their own relatives, their own daughters and granddaughters and even great granddaughters, because again, you know, no fresh blood can enter the gene pool. Uh, and they've started to suffer various genetic defects uh, as a result of this, all of this chronic inbreeding. Uh, and they've entered what scientists have called an extinction vortex, you know, this long-term doom spiral caused by the, the inbreeding that uh, the highway creates. So we have these two, you know, kind of linked problems, right? We've got this, you know, wildlife vehicle collision epidemic, this roadkill epidemic, you know, we're hitting, we're hitting deer all over the place. And we've got this barrier effect, right? This kind of wall of traffic that prevents animals from moving safely around the landscape. So how do we solve those two related problems? And, you know, really the best tool we have at our disposal are wildlife crossings, right? These overpasses, underpasses, tunnels, all kinds of different structures. Uh, that allow animals to safely move over highways without us 
uh, hitting them. And this is a wildlife overpass, a wildlife bridge uh, in Montana that I visited on Highway uh, 93 that's been used by, you know, moose and elk and deer and bears and all, all kinds of uh, all kinds of critters. So wildlife crossings, you know, they really come of age uh, in the uh, in the 1950s, uh, or that, at least that, that's when they're they're pioneered. Uh, in France, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, you know, Western Europe. Uh, over time, the Netherlands becomes uh, sort of the, the world's leader uh, in wildlife crossing technology. You know, the Dutch, of course, they're just good engineers at, uh, at, at everything. This is a kilometer long Dutch wildlife overpass that crosses uh, two highways, a railroad track, uh, an office park, a sports complex, all kinds of other uh, stuff, a pretty, a pretty cool, pretty cool structure. Uh, the place that, that wildlife crossings really become famous is in, is in Canada, in, in Banff National Park, a, a place that, you know, I bet some of you have, have been. And, you know, there in Banff, you know, Banff, like so many national parks around the world, you know, has a highway running right through the middle of it, the Trans-Canada Highway, and lots of animals are being killed. So starting in the 1980s, Parks Canada built uh, around 40 of these wildlife crossings, you know, underpasses and about a, a half dozen uh, wildlife overpasses. Um, and you know the overpasses were really designed primarily for grizzly bears. You know, grizzly bears are an animal that they don't really use. They don't really want to go through an underpass. You know, they're this big, powerful, fast creature that wants to you know meet their enemies out in the open. So they want to be up on top of a bridge rather than uh, you know in a tunnel. So they build these overpasses for grizzly bears. And you know what these the researchers who studied these these uh, passages discovered is that you know the bears use them very readily. Uh, you know, they move back and forth and they mate on either side. So that kind of genetic inbreeding caused by the highway is, you know, being mitigated by the, the crossing structure, which allows the animals to move back and forth. And then, you know, what's, what's really cool is that the, 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 the sow bears, the female bears, actually teach their cubs how to use the crossings. And then their cubs become crossers and teach their cubs. So there's this whole kind of intergenerational uh, learning dynamic that happens that, you know, scientists document over the course of many, many years. Um, and, you know, really proves beyond a doubt that, you know, these these sorts of wildlife crossings are, are effective. And, you know, today you can see kind of Banff inspired wildlife crossings in Argentina and uh, Singapore and uh, all over the world. Um, and, you know, possibly there'll be one uh, in, in the Hudson Valley pretty soon. And we'll talk about that uh, in, a, in a minute. So here, you know, here in the U.S., uh, you know, most of the early wildlife crossings are built in the American West, right? Colorado, Wyoming, Utah. And the reason for that is that, you know, those states have these big migratory herds of deer, elk, and antelope, right? So there are these big clusters of hundreds or even thousands of animals all moving together, uh, you know, back and forth across uh, across the landscape. And so, if, you know, if a thousand deer, uh, you know, cross a highway in the same place every single year and 50 of them get killed, you know, there's a big blinking sign saying, you know, hey, put a wildlife underpass right here, right? If they're, you know, these migratory Western herds of animals are pretty easy to deal with. Whereas, you know, in the East, uh, there's, they're just kind of like white-tailed deer all over the place, or so it seems. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of Eastern states kind of say, well, we can't really solve this problem because there aren't, you know, discrete migratory pathways or, or hotspots, but that's starting to change. And we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, in a in a minute, but just to say that you know the Western states historically uh, have been have been leaders uh, you know in the field of, of wildlife crossings. One of the things that you know a lot of the engineers who work on these projects realize pretty quickly is that you know these wildlife crossings don't work without fences, right? Fences are integral to getting animals to and through the passages. You know, people always say, how do the animals know to use the crossings? And, you know, the answer is the fences basically force them, right? If you're a deer and you're trying to cross a highway, well, you know, you bump into a mile long fence and you just pace that fence line until you find the underpass and then you go through, right? So those, you know, the, the, the fences keep the animals off the highway uh, and the, the passages, the underpasses and overpasses get them across, right? Those two kind of infrastructural features work really, really well together. Another kind of important piece of the puzzle are these jump outs, uh, which are basically these one way escape ramps. So if you're a deer and you somehow break through the fence and now you're trapped, you know, in the road corridor and you're, you know, you don't know how to get out. Well, you, you can find one of these exit ramps basically and, you know, leap out of traffic uh, safely. So those, those jump outs are a really important piece of it uh, as, as well. Another, you know, important lesson that people who work on these, these projects discover over time is that 
you know, you really have to think about the entire ecosystem, right? It's not just, you know, the deer and the bears and the kind of the big critters. There are also, you know, the mustelids, the weasel family, you know, the, the, the mink and the skunks and the badgers, you know, there's the, uh, you know, there's the, there are of course all of the rodents, you know, there are the amphibians, the reptiles, you know, all of these smaller critters, their habitat is being, you know, divided uh, by the highway as, as well. And you really have to account for that, you know, that entire suite of fauna that's trying to cross the road. Uh, and so, you know, what, what uh, a lot of these researchers start to add are, are kind of these, you know, habitat features that make animals, especially the smaller animals, more comfortable. So this is a wildlife overpass uh, on I-90 near, near Seattle, um, a really, really cool project, uh, you know, and, and lots of elk and coyotes, you know, use this overpass. But, you know, in this case, the Department of Transportation, they also put in all of these logs and rocks and other, you know, sort of features that, uh, you know, again, those smaller rodents and reptiles uh, use as well. So just, you know, thinking about the whole ecosystem, right, accounting for, for everybody, uh, I think is, is, uh, is, is really important. Here's another, you know, this is another, uh, this is an underpass on, on I-90, also near Seattle, uh, you know, very close to this, this overpass. And, you know, again, there are some animals that like to go over, some like to go under, you know, you're trying to give them options, essentially, you know, and here, the other thing you can see that's, that's kind of cool is this long line of rocks, uh, you know, running through the underpass. And that's, that's really good for the reptiles and the pikas, which are like a little rabbit, essentially, that, you know, live in the talus slope, uh, you know, they need that that rock line to basically draw them through the uh, the underpass. So again, you know, just think about all of the different critters that uh, you know you you might have to to get across the highway. And here's another another wildlife crossing in the in the same it's kind of the same stretch of highway. You know, this kind of enlarged culvert that follows a stream. So you know, you've got all of these sort of aquatic animals, beavers, otters, salamanders that also have to get across the roadway. And you know, and, and if you don't have crossings at streams, you know, you're, you're not going to be able to help them. But, you know, by giving them kind of this nice big culvert to move through, you know, you're helping all of those aquatic critters as well. So again, just thinking about the whole ecosystem, right, and, and getting all of those different animals across. So, you know, the, I, I mentioned, I mentioned culverts and, uh, you know, culverts don't get a lot of, uh, a lot of love. You know, they're sort of these invisible pieces of infrastructure that we don't, we don't think about uh, very much, but they're also really good wildlife passage, right? You know, we've built all of these pipes and tunnels to convey streams and wetlands and other water under roads, but animals also use those, those passages as well. You know, there are some Something like 2,000 purpose-built wildlife crossings in America and something like 2 million culverts for the, the passage of water. And, you know, with a little bit of forethought and, uh, and retrofitting, you know, those culverts can be really good wildlife passages as, as well. You know, we can make them even better for animals than they, they already are. So this is a, a little tech piece of technology called a critter shelf. Uh, so this is a culvert. Um, this is in Montana, but actually there are lots of these in the Adirondacks, uh, these critter shelves. Uh, and basically the idea here is that, you know, this, so this culvert, uh, you know, sort of conveys a seasonal stream under a highway. Um, so, you know, in spring, after the rains and snow melt, uh, you know, the water comes up. Uh, and when the culvert is partially flooded, you know, the animals don't want to walk through, right? Creatures like bobcats and skunks, you know, they don't want to get their feet wet. So you build them a little critter shelf uh, and they can walk through the culvert while staying dry, right? So that's a, you know, a really good way of just taking an existing piece of infrastructure and, and tweaking it uh, to make it, uh, you know, more effective for, for wildlife. Uh, so not every, you know, wildlife crossing has to be a big, beautiful, you know, $10 million overpass. There's a lot we can do, uh, you know, for, at a, a, pretty, a pretty low cost. And again, there are, you know, there are a bunch of these things uh, in, in New York State and uh, in, in upstate in the Adirondacks uh, as, as well. Another good illustration of, you know, kind of working with the infrastructure that's already in the landscape. Um, there's a, a really cool project in, in Virginia that I, I love to talk about. And this is on I-64, which is, you know, sort of this, um, this deer collision uh, mecca. You know, Virginia is sort of always one of the worst states when it comes to per capita deer vehicle collisions. Uh, and so in this case, you know, there, there were a couple of existing culverts on the landscape already, right? They were, they, you know, they weren't built for wildlife, but they're, they're built to, you know, convey seasonal streams and wetlands under the, under the, uh, the interstate. But, you know, VDOT, the Department of Transportation, basically said, you know, hey, wait a second, I bet we can do, I bet, if, you know, if we just fence the highway, we can basically force the animals to use these culverts and, you know, take these, take these water conveyance passages and make them good wildlife passages. 
So with, you know, with VDOT data a few years ago is they, they fenced off, uh, you know, just a couple of miles of highway on either side of these culverts. You know, they reduced the, the deer crashes by more than 90%. They saw a fourfold increase in deer usage of the passages, right? So the deer can't cross the highway anymore over the surface. They have to, they have to go under through these passages. So they start to use the passages, you know, so do bears and foxes and opossums and all kinds of other critters. Um, but, you know, what was so cool about this, uh, you know, this project was that it actually recouped its own costs in under two years, right? So again, you fence that highway, you make the animals use the passages, and you're preventing all of those really dangerous, expensive deer crashes we were talking about. And, you know, you're, you're saving the public a lot of money really, really quickly. Uh, and, you know, I think that's a, a kind of a, an important point about, you know, wildlife crossings in general is that, you know, they're, yes, they're good conservation policy, but they're also really good fiscal policy. Again, you know, they just prevent so many crashes uh, that they pay for themselves pretty rapidly, you know, and this is uh, one example of that. This is a, a wildlife overpass in Wyoming that was built for uh, antelope and, and deer, uh, you know, and I think it was a, something like a $5 million project. And, you know, all of the fiscal conservatives were kind of wringing their hands about it when it was proposed, like, you know, we're really going to spend $5 million helping antelope cross the highway. But, you know, this structure paid for its own costs uh, in something like four years, uh, again, just by preventing all of these, these expensive crashes. So, you know, these, these crossings are really win, 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 wins, you know, add as many wins as you, you want onto that. Of course, the problem with, you know, focusing on deer and antelope and elk and moose, you know, the large dangerous animals that you know, imperil driver safety is that, you know, when you're just focused on crash prevention, you know, you're not thinking about the smaller critters, right? Nobody's ever totaled their car hitting, you know, a, a, a wood frog or a, a northern red-legged frog or a garter snake, uh, you know, or a, or a toad, right? Uh, you know, these are all of these these smaller creatures that, you know, are, are in many cases existentially threatened uh, by traffic. And yet, you know, we haven't really built passages for them um, because we take this very sort of cost-benefit driver safety focused perspective uh, on, on wildlife crossing. So, you know, I mean, to me, you know, yes, it's great to build, let's build all of the deer passages in the world. Um, but, you know, we also need uh, passages for the, the smaller, the smaller critters as well that, you know, aren't a danger to us drivers, but are, are still a big uh, conser conservation issue. You know, I'll add that, that other countries tend to be a little bit better about that than, uh, you know, I think we are here in, in cost conscious America. Uh, you know, there are some really wonderful wildlife crossings around the world. There's uh, you know, this kind of fabulous, very famous uh, wildlife bridge for, for migratory land crabs on, in, uh, on Christmas Island. Uh, you know, the crabs migrate between, uh, you know, rainforest and beach to spawn in, in literally in the millions. Uh, and they've built a, a number of these kind of steel bridges for them. So that's pretty cool, right? It's sort of hard to imagine uh, you know, the United States building a, a crab bridge, but uh, you know, that's the kind of thing that's happening elsewhere. Uh, you know, there are also lots of really cool arboreal crossings, you know, canopy crossings out there, right? You think about all of the tree dwelling animals that you know, never descend to the forest floor. So they're never gonna use a conventional wildlife underpass, but you know, they're being fragmented by highways as well, right? There are all of these little isolated forest patches out there surrounded by roads. And so what some countries like Australia do is they actually build these rope bridges and ladders between those, those forest fragments so that all of the arboreal or tree dwelling animals can you know, scamper back and forth. That's a, a squirrel glider, a little tree dwelling marsupial. Uh, you know, and look, I mean, here in the U.S., you know, we, we have plenty of uh, arboreal animals as well, right? We've got, you know, flying squirrels and porcupines and, uh, you know, martens and all kinds of other critters that would benefit from this sort of thing. Uh, but, you know, we haven't really uh, done done uh, much or, or any of this yet, right? So, again, I think we need a more diverse perspective on, you know, what constitutes a, a wildlife crossing. Uh, and again, you know, I, I, I want to emphasize this is this is truly the kind of a, a global movement, right, to get animals across uh, across the highway. You know, Brazil, uh, where I, I went in the course of writing this book, you know, has lots of passages for tapirs and pumas and anteaters and all kinds of other other critters. Uh, you know, Nepal has some really wonderful uh, new laws that basically compel the construction of wildlife crossings with any new highway, um, you know, for tigers and rhinos and uh, all kinds of other uh, other other animals. Kenya has built a bunch of wildlife underpasses for elephants. So you think about how big that underpass has to be, right, to get elephants through it. Um, and then, you know, I think some of the most the most radical stuff is, is happening in India, 
uh, you know, and India is a country that's that's developing really rapidly, building lots of new highways. Uh, but you know, in some cases, at least, they're they're doing it right in a way that we failed to. Right? You know, here in the U.S., we have this interstate highway system that we built in the 1950s and 60s and 70s before we knew uh, just how serious uh, the problem of, of roads and nature really was. And, you know, a lot of these countries that are kind of building from scratch now, like India, can learn from our mistakes and, and again, get it right the first time. So, you know, in India, you see these elevated stretches of highway that are, you know, in some cases, 10 or 15 miles long, so that instead of having, you know, an isolated underpass, you know, the entire forest floor is, is wide open and the animals can just move back and forth, right? So again, you know, I, th I think there's a, a lot of really exciting creative stuff, uh, you know, happening, happening uh, outside the U.S. And, and Western Europe right now. So this is a really exciting time for for uh, you know for these these wildlife crossings we've been talking about. Uh, you know the the 2021 um, Federal Infrastructure Act uh, included 350 million dollars uh, for for new wildlife crossings, uh, which is you know by far the largest pot of money ever allocated to this issue. Granted, we need a lot more, uh, but you know that's that's a, a you know a pretty a pretty good place to start. Um, and you know that that money, some of that money has been allocated already, and you know. A, a big chunk of it went to Western states, um, you know, like Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, you know, states who have been doing this sort of thing for decades. But, you know, it was really exciting to see uh, a lot of Eastern states get grants as well. You know, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Missouri, Kentucky, all got grants to start, you know, start the process of figuring out where to put wildlife crossing. So, you know, this is historically, again, this kind of this Western phenomenon um, that's gradually shifting eastward and that's that's really exciting because you know one of the places uh that uh you know lots of conservationists are talking about uh you know having a, a wildlife overpass which would be the first wildlife overpass in the state of new york uh is over i-87 uh the new york thruway in the in hudson valley and this is near cornwall um that this is uh you know meant to be built um and uh you know there's there's been lots of research again showing that you know i-87 is this huge barrier to the movement of not only deer, but you know, black bears, fishers, bobcats, coyotes, all kinds of critters, uh, and um, you know, so there's there's this lots of data basically documenting uh, the need for uh, a structure in in this this situation. Um, Kind of a, a group of uh, you know, and, and look, I mean, this is this this idea is supported by the Thruway Authority, the New York State Parks Department. Uh, Chuck Schumer, I think, has has uh, talked about it a little bit. Um, this is the location, and this is uh, again, you know, near near Cornwall. Uh, the overpass would kind of go from these you know these hills on the far our side uh, down into this this field um, and uh, you know the kind of the conservationists led by the Black Rock Forest uh, up, up there near Cornwall you know they, they actually did put in a grant application uh, for that that federal wildlife crossings program uh, didn't get funded this this year but you know there's still a couple of iterations of that of that funding to be dispersed uh, over the next uh, the next couple of years so it's uh, you know kind of kind of an exciting time uh, you know that the, the first uh, the first wildlife overpass in the state of New York you know could could uh, ultimately uh, end up being you know built in our, our backyards in the not too distant future um, and I'll, I'll add too that uh, you know that there is a Wildlife crossings bill before the New York State Assembly right now, you know, passed out of the state Senate Environmental Committee uh, last year, I believe. Um, and basically, you know, the, the crossings bill would essentially require uh, the State Department of Transportation to, you know, look at all of the major highways around the state of New York, you know, figure out where the potential wildlife crossing locations are, um, and it would it would force the state to uh, create kind of a top five priority list. Um, you know, here are the kind of the five major places where we you know we we want to build some of these things, and you know let's apply for some of that federal funding that that would make it happen. So again, you know, New York not a state that's done a ton of this uh, work uh, historically, but a place where there's a real need. Obviously, based on that, you know that that kind of deer collision epidemic, um, and uh, a place that could be doing some of this stuff uh, in the not too distant future. So it's a, a pretty exciting time uh, to be uh, working in working in this space uh, in the in the Hudson Highlands, especially. So you know, ultimately, uh, both the challenge and the opportunity before us is to you know remake our infrastructure to save biodiversity. Right, no pressure. Uh, you know, we know that we're in the middle of this mass extinction event, the sixth in our planetary in our in our, our planetary history. 
Uh, you know, we're, we're in the middle of a biodiversity crisis, you know, rare species are going extinct, common species are, are becoming rare. Uh, you know, that's happening in, uh, in New York as, as well as uh, every, everywhere else. And, uh, you know, in so many cases, our infrastructure is, is uh, contributing to that, that crisis. You know, as I said at the start of this talk, you know, there's literally nothing that we do. Uh, you know, that kills more wild animals directly than, than drive. So if we're going to save biodiversity on this planet, you know, we have to confront uh, the impacts of our, our, our road system. And, you know, here's just one illustration of that. Uh, this is a, a wildlife underpass uh, in South Texas, and, and Texas is home to uh, the U.S.'s only remaining population of ocelots. There are fewer than 100 ocelots left, all in this little corner of South Texas. And car car collisions uh, are something like 40% of ocelot mortality, right? By far the leading cause of mortality. So this is a species, you know, one of the rarest species we have in the U.S. that we are losing right now uh, because because of cars uh, and traffic. And if we're going to save ocelots and so many other species uh, on this planet, you know, we have to deal with the impacts of, of roads. Um, so with that, uh, I'll say thanks so much. Uh, you know, as, as Joan mentioned, I did uh, write a book about uh, about this uh, this subject, um, which is uh, available everywhere books are sold. Uh, I'll say briefly that the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, uh, among other publications, uh, both seem to love it. So, you know, liberals and conservatives united uh, around the topic of uh, road ecology. Uh, pretty cool to see. And, uh, and I, say, thanks I'm sorry, I just wanted to interrupt yeah. because we did have some questions. But first, I want yeah. to mention that somebody asked about something I forgot to mention, um, your okay. education. And um, just so you know, Ben Goldfarb is it has a Master's of Environmental Management from Yale School of Forestry and Invent Environmental Studies and is the 2018 North American Congress for Co Conservation Biology Journalist Fellow. So he's got quite the reputation. And this book that I hope you will all purchase, Crossings, has been named one of the best books for 2023 by the New York Times. Um, the other magazines that he has has written for, besides Atlantic and um, National Geographic, is Science, The New York Times, Washington Post, uh, Mother Jones, Smithsonian, Nation, and others. So I hope you will go to your local bookstore and or Amazon uh, or Barnes and Nobles and purchase the book. Now, we did have some questions, so I would like to just um, ask you about that. The first sure. question, <clears throat> someone asked about what are the implications of all the trash and debris, roadside, roadside debris, and the fact that the budgets have been cut for cleanup on the diets of the animals and their safety? Yeah, so it's a it's a good question, and and you know just just um, one one more educational point by the way, most important. I'd say I'm, I'm a graduate of Hastings High School, uh, so you know go 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 Yellow Jackets. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean you know cer certainly uh, you know it's a, it's a it's a good it's a, a good question about the trash and and and, uh, and debris. Um, you know that's obviously a, another dangerous conflict, right? Is that you know people throw all kinds of you know, leftover food at, at the window. And, and then that, you know, that becomes, uh, you know, yet another sort of enticement, you know, drawing animals closer to the road, you know, creating dangerous situations. So, you know, I, I can't really speak to, to budget cuts, uh, you know, at, uh, at NISDOT at the, you know, the state uh, DOT, um, but, you know, certainly, uh, you know, lots of, lots of DOTs around the country are, you know, are seeing their, their budgets, uh, their budgets reduced, especially for, for maintenance. And, and, uh, you know, that's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue for sure. So, you know, I just encourage people, you know, I, I definitely try to avoid, you know, throwing my apple core out the window, for example, um, you know, that, that's a, a small thing, but, uh, you know, definitely, uh, you know, we don't want to be luring animals uh, any closer to the roadside than they are already. Yeah, that's a good point. And um, people asked, who do they write to if they want to um, uh, uh, to to get a bill pa the bill passed? Do you have the, uh, any idea? Who yeah, it's a, it's a it's a it's a good that's a that's a, a really that's a really good question. Um, you know, I would I would say that that in um, you know, so one of the one of the, I know that I mentioned these guys before, but you know, one of the groups that's 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 leading a lot of this habitat connectivity work uh, in New York is is uh, is Black Rock Forest, and again, they're you know they're up in Cornwall, uh, so it might be worth dropping them a line. 
um, they could, uh, you know, probably point you uh, in the right in the right direction. But you know, if you just uh, you know search for New York Wildlife Crossings Act, you know, you'll find lots of information uh, about okay. where where that is right now in the uh, in the, the the state assembly. Could you just repeat that? I'll put that in the chat. Yeah, it's called it's called it's called the New the New York Wildlife Crossings Act. Okay, great. So um, that would be a good thing for people to um, find out the information and to write, because as we could see how important it is. So thank you. Any other questions? Well, I guess that, oh yes. Do you need us to write to our representatives or is it quite, does it have quite support, enough support already? Yeah, that's you know that's a, that's a it's a, it's a you're that's a great question. Um, you know, I I I would say that writing to representatives has never ever hurt anything. Um, so I you know yeah. I did I did encourage you to do so. Um, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, and, and and I think Rose, I guess Rose just put this in the chat. Rose to, just put the the uh, link in. Yeah, H -H but, New York Senate Yeah, she did. Yeah, you know if you know if you could if if you could actually repost that, Joan. I think I think Rose's link might have only gone to us. Um, okay. But if you can, uh, you know, put that in the chat to everyone. Yep. That would that would be great. I'll do that. Um, and um, there was another question. Wait, let me just get to that question. Moose hits. Moose hits a big problem in Maine. Are you aware of the efforts in that area? Yeah, certainly. You know, Maine Maine is definitely um, you know trying trying to get some some of these wildlife underpasses built. Uh, you know, moose moose collisions are also an issue in in upstate New York as well. You know, in the Adirondacks. Uh, and you know, moose. I mean, moose are obviously that's an animal you definitely don't want to hit. You know, uh, they're, yeah. they're so they're so huge. Uh, you know, the average I, I said before that the average deer collision costs something like nine thousand dollars. Well, the average moose collision costs more than forty thousand um, dollars because it's again, you know, it, it's just such a, a dangerous uh, situation that you know sends so many drivers to the hospital. So uh, yeah, definitely, moose are a really important animal to uh, address in this this kind of work. Okay, she gave us another link, which I will share in a minute. Great. Okay, that should be coming to everybody right now. So you have two links if you are interested in helping out. There are two links that uh, Rose uh, gave us, and I hope you will all work towards this aim. This is a really a very noble aim, and when you go out, you know, driving around, you want to be able to um, know that you're not the reason that somebody's getting hurt there. Some animal is getting hurt. One is assembly and one is Senate. Okay. Thank you, Rose. That was really nice of you. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? So no more apple uh, cores going out on the side of the road <laughs> to encourage animals to go to the side. I never thought of it that way. I really never did. I thought it was, you know, oh, I'm yeah. feeding the wildlife. Don't, My don't, don't check your apple cores and write, you know, write your uh, your your assembly people. <laughs> personal, okay. personal, and political action. Right. So thank you all, um, and please visit your local libraries. We have lots of wonderful programs going on, and I just go to their website, uh, like ours is ChappaquaLibrary.org, and the others would be whatever um, Yonkers uh, Public Library and and whatnot. So please visit your local library. Thank you all for coming, and we'll see you again. Bye, and Ben, thank you so much for a great presentation. Bye, Thanks. everyone. Take care.